Well, happy Sunday, everybody. My name is uh, Tom Cook. I'm the uh, servant as the interim uh, while Ryan is away on his sabbatical, which is only a few more weeks left. I can't believe we're halfway through August already, um, almost all the way halfway through. Um, there are a lot of announcements that I want, I want to share with you, but they're all repeats. Um, one is that the prayer group continues to meet today after worship down in the history room. Um, if you have prayer concerns, you can take them down there. If you want to support in those prayer concerns, uh, uh, come on down afterward. Uh, and then I also want to tell you that, um, uh, okay, how many times do we have to repeat this Sunday after Sunday? We need somebody back there to spell people on the, on the lyrics, uh, lyrics and all that other stuff that happens in, in worship service. So, um, and yeah. I'll say, sorry to interrupt, but I'll also, uh, uh, as a part of that announcement, will say that today our display system, our projector and computer are not talking to each other. So we will be working exclusively out of the hymnal for our hymns, and hopefully you received a hand-printed version of what would have been displayed for the spoken and unison prayers. And so um, let that not be a discouragement to you, you, though, if you want to be involved. You don't have to know advanced computer programming. You just need to be able to point and click most of the time. So, so talk to me if you're interested. So have the computer and the display system been referred to marital counseling if they're not talking yeah, to each other? Yeah, they're in mediation. They're in okay. mediation okay. now, and Good. we're, we're getting that squared so away. we got to teach them to get along better, but uh, okay. Uh, and then um, also a messy church. Uh, the last meeting is the 17th, This uh, and that's the last meeting for the summer at least, and it's at the Donahoe House, and I think that's about it for an announcements. Are there any visitors who would like to introduce themselves? Does anybody have a guest they'd like to embarrass by introducing? Kathy? Betty Davis, Betty Davis is here former member of uh, the Presby Presbyterian Church in Harbor Springs, and uh, also my kids' babysitters. Uh, sitter from when uh, they were, my daughter was three months old, and I just showed her, showed her a picture of my third, sixth grandchild, uh, and the youngest of them all, from the daughter she babysat when she was three months old, so, um, when we moved here, so, yeah, yes. Good, and where are you from? Um, I'm from Ann Arbor. Ann Arbor? Good. Good to have you here. Um, Michigan State people, just calm down, okay. <laughs> so, uh, um, any other visitors? Well, uh, it's great to have you here in worship. We hope that you find that this worship service is uh, uh, full of hospitality and welcome, and pray that you come back uh, to, to worship with us. Uh, let's begin the holy worship of God, and we'll do that with our prelude. Thank you. 
Good morning, Jane Denae. I'm very familiar with this church, but not this microphone. So good to see you all this morning. Call to worship, we'll read responsively. We shall, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessings from the Lord and vindication from the God of his salvation. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Let us worship. Our first hymn today is hymn number one in the hymnal. We'll sing verses one and four. Please stand if you're comfortable to do that. For those of you streaming at home, I hope you have your hymnals with you. <laughs> Printed pay bulletins? I mean, okay. So we can do the prayer of confession together. And, um, and that is a privilege that we have as Presbyterians. We, we recognize the need to speak with God truthfully about what's on our hearts and our minds. And, and even before the words are formed by our lips, God knows what's on our hearts and our minds when it comes to our prayer of confession. 
The words I have written are just vehicles for to open up our hearts to God, to make us conscious of that. But God already knows what's there. And so let's pray, pray the printed prayer of confession that's in, that's in your hand now, and then we'll follow it with our own silent confessions. Let's pray. You would have us will one thing, O Lord, the one good thing, to do your will. We will will something else. We will anything else. We will what we want. We want what we want, when we want it, the way we want it. We are troubled when we do not get what we want. We get angry. We confuse our wants with our needs. Apart from your grace, we know neither what or, or what we need. You know our needs better than we know them ourselves. And you want better for us than we want for ourselves. We would put in our needs before the one good thing to do your will. And now hear these our silent prayers. Amen. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Thanks be to God. Amen. We'll sing number 418, 418. Any kids want to come up? Hey guys, what's your Charlotte? Hi Charlotte and Parker. Hi guys. Hi. You're gonna have to remind me of your names. Max. Max and Frankie. Good to see you guys again. You can't stand up because I I'm gonna have you over here. Come over here and talk with you. Okay. Every day, every Sunday, we, we uh, come on over here, guys, and stand up. Every, every Sunday, uh, well, maybe this isn't so stable. Let's go back over to the font. <laughs> I had one of these hand-blown uh, at our church in Grant Haven and uh, by Harry Boyer in Harbor Springs, who was a friend of mine, and it, it took him about five attempts to make a bowl and so I'm very careful about these. So so every every worship service some of you guys have done it that yourselves what do you do what we do at the kind of at the beginning of the worship service. Go ahead, Max. You, you take that water. Why do you think we do that? <laughs> I don't know. I was I was wondering about that. So, hmm? It's well, yeah. It's holy. It's special water, that's for sure. In some churches, they do call it holy water because it has a special oh, blessing on it. Yeah, well, some churches do call it holy water. In in the Presbyterian Church, it's just water, but it's water that's been set aside for a special purpose. So in that way, it's holy. Um, do you guys want to touch it? Anybody want to touch it? 
It's just regular water. Go ahead. You can touch it. Okay? You know, you know, no, no, okay, that's okay. It's kind of cold water, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, water, what do, you, what, what, do, what do we use water for? Go ahead, Max. We drink. We have, when we're thirsty, we need water, right? And our parents say we got to hydrate now, but it's usually we just got to drink, right? We need a drink because, because like we can need that to live. Yeah, we need water to live. Yeah, so. Hmm? Half of your body is water? Yeah, I think at least half your body is water. God made you, so technically, I think that water has to do something with humans because they're made from water. Yeah, that's true. Water is really important, and that's why we got to drink a lot so we can keep it in. What's some other things that we use water for? Uh, bath. bath. Take a bath, right, or a shower. Um, you know when. Um, go ahead. Yeah, cooking. For what? Tours. Oh, tours? No, pools. pools. Oh, yeah, that's nice going in a pool, isn't it? Do you have a friend who's got a pool? You don't have a friend who's got a pool, but when you go to on a on a vacation, it's fun to go in a pool. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Where did you live in Virginia? Do you remember? Oh, my daughter lives in Virginia. She lives in Charlottesville. So, yeah, water is really important to life, our lives. We, we need it, don't we? There's one other thing that we use water for, and it's probably why we use it in worship service, too. We baptize with water. Now, do any of you know if you've been baptized? Max? Charlotte? Okay, heavy, okay. Let's ask how many, how many people out here have been baptized? Wow, look at, I would say almost everybody's been baptized here. Why do you think people are baptized? I know, I know what it means. What's it mean? It shows that you're Christian. That's a really important thing to remember. And that's one thing I want to talk about. What are these, some of the other reasons why we baptize? Just to cover those. Well, one of them is we say, it's like a bath, it washes away our sin. It's a, it's a symbol of washing away our sin. And so that's why a lot, sometimes when we do a confession in this church, we, we, do, we do things with this water. You know, you really can't hold on to water, can you? You can't squeeze it. You can't, there's nothing really to grip onto with water. Yeah, it just... Yeah, it all goes away, doesn't it? Water always goes down to the lowest spot. That's right. Well, uh, I've baptized probably... How many people do you think I've baptized? No, not a hundred. Probably like 56. No. 56? <laughs> probably more than, not many, but like around 30. Around 30. I've baptized over 526 people. And, and well, you got to remember, I've been around for a long time. I mean, that's a... 44 years of, of being in the ministry. So uh, I baptized over 500 people. And every time I baptize, uh, and they're mostly kids, every time I baptize them, I take the water and I, and I come here, I, I mark their forehead with a sign of a cross. Like that. Can I do that, Nate? I do, I, I mark their forehead with a sign of a cross. You know what I tell them? I tell them is that this is like a tattoo. It's an invisible tattoo, but it's like a tattoo that reminds you that you are a follower of Jesus. And when you become a follower of Jesus, that means you are kind of different than most people. That means that Jesus has some really good expectations for you. And what do you think some of the things that Jesus wants you to do? Be kind. That's a really important thing. Don't like when they don't like getting into wars or laws or break the law. Don't what? Break like the law. Break the law. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But he also is a very forgiving person, so he expects us to forgive other people too, right? Right. And and that we love other people. 
So that's a hard thing to do sometimes in the world, and that's what I'm going to be talking to your moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas about today, is that, uh, that we have to kind of hold on to that baptism, that cross. We have to kind of let the world know that even though it's invisible, that that tattoo is on our forehead saying that I am a follower of Jesus. And when I'm a follower of Jesus, I'm going to act the best I can in the way that Jesus wants me to. That's a really good point. You, they should be able to figure it out by the way you act and the way you live your life. Right. Okay. Uh, let's uh, gather around here and hold hands, okay? And I'm going to ask you to repeat after me, and I'm going to ask the whole congregation to repeat with, with, with us. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus thank, you thank you for baptism and making us your own. And making us your own. Help us to show the world, show the world that, we are that we are your children. Your children. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. And thanks for coming up today. Okay? And for all the good answers. It's great when you have kids come up and they, they're so bright and know exactly where you're going. So this morning we have two scripture lessons. The first one is from Exodus uh, chapter 32. And I'm reading from uh, verses 1 through 14. Listen to this God's word as uh, it tells us the story of Moses going up to the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments and Aaron losing his grip on the people of Israel. Listen to this. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods we will go bef they who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. And answer, Aaron answered him, them, remember Aaron is Moses' brother, Aaron answered them, take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron and he took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. And then they said, then he, they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord, so that the next day the people rose early, sacrificed burnt offerings, and presented fellowship offerings. And afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down, because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of, the, out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. I love that word, stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord, his God. Lord, he said, why should you, your anger burn against your people whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger. Relent and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham and Isaac and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them. 
and it will be their inheritance. Then the Lord relented. Some people wonder whether God ever changes his mind or her mind. In this case, we see God relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. Well, that's our first scripture lesson. The second scripture lesson comes to us from uh, Paul's letter to the Philippians, uh, which he wrote from prison. And listen to this God's word. I'm reading from chapter 1, verses 21 through 28, the first half of that passage. And so Paul wrote, For to me living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation, and this is God's doing. For he, oh, and that's where it ends, our scripture. Let's bow just for a few moments and ask God to to guide us as we try to understand it. In our own lives, let's pray. Oh Lord, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations that I offer might be acceptable to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I am a lucky kid because I got to attend camp on the shores of Lake Michigan near Glen Arbor. Michigan. Um, it was Camp Leelanau. Now the odd thing about me going to Camp Leelanau is that it was a Christian science camp, scientist camp, and my father was a physician. So there was a little bit of incongru- incongruence for me while I was attending that camp, but I got to tell you it was some of the best summers of my life and some of the most formative experiences I ever had came from Camp Leelanau. One of the things we did as a camp is we divided the whole camp up into three teams. There was a red team and a green team and a blue team. And uh, all throughout the summer, there was an accumulation of points through various comp- competitions, playing Russian American and camping, uh, camping excursions and capture the flag games. And, and, uh, and at the end of the season, there was the very determinative event in camp called the Water Olympics. Now, during the Water Olympics, we did some really weird things that our parents would never approve of today. One of them was that we would stand two campers on either end of the canoe. You'd have to stand up, and each had a long pole with a boxing glove on it, and the whole point was to try to knock the other camper off the the canoe. I mean, I just can't imagine um, my kids allowing their kids to do that today. But it was a blast, and... You know, inevitably, you can't really hurt anybody too much when you hit them with a stick with a boxing glove on it, right? Well, anyway, one camper would fall into the water, and you know that that team, the the remain, the one on the on the on the canoe, would would get points for that. Well, probably one of the most bizarre games of all during the Water Olympics at Camp Leelanau uh, resembled rugby. And it took place in water that was from knee deep to chest high. And you had 10 campers on each team. And in the middle of those 10 campers, you would take a watermelon, a greased watermelon, greased with Vaseline, petroleum jelly, and you would throw it in there. And the object was for each, for each team to try to get that greased watermelon over a goal line. Well, you can imagine what this is like. Can you imagine trying to hold on to it? Has anybody ever done this before? Greased watermelon contest? Yeah, they're... they're, Well, can you imagine 
throwing a greased watermelon in the middle of 20 kids divided into two teams and telling them to score a point. And here you are trying to grab this greased watermelon, which you can't anyway, because there's no handles, there's no edges, there's nothing to grip onto that watermelon. It's just frankly too slippery. Imagine trying to grab a hold of that, and when you finally do grab a hold of it, having 10 campers pounce on top of you, dunk you underwater until the watermelon popped out. The greased watermelon contest. It was hilarious. It was a blast. We loved doing this stuff. Getting a grip. You can't easily grip a floating greased watermelon. As I said, there are no handles, no corners, no edges, no ridges, nothing to grab onto, just a greasy, wet, smooth, oblong hunk of fruit. Getting a grip. On some circumstances, life deals us can at times be, lo be like scoring a goal with a greased watermelon. It's hard to find something to grab onto. Just, it's hard to get a grip. Paul talks about this in our morning scripture lesson. He's writing not so much about greased watermelon contests, but about getting a grip on something almost as slippery Paul is talking about getting a grip on faith. To the church in Philippi, Paul wrote, Live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side, together as a team with one mind for the faith of the gospel and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. You need to know that the church in Philippi was struggling to hold on to this new Christian identity in a Roman world that was ruled by secularism, secular, secularism and pantheism. A world that was tempting them with message, messages that were contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Messages that weren't all that different from some of the messages we get today from our world as it challenges our faith. And in the face of these, live for today, grab it while you can, even if you can't afford it, messages what did Paul hope for, for the Philippians? He wanted them to hold fast, to get a grip, to not let go of the gospel, to live up to that invisible tattoo I talked with the kids about. The world is full of Christians on retreat, who when the going gets tough play down their Christian faith, they buckle into the whims and the pressures placed on them by easy, seductive choices. And Paul expects the Philippians to stand fast, to stand unashamed in, in any company to let their lifestyles and their beliefs rule their lives, and most of all, to hold on to them. I think Paul hopes pretty much the same thing for the church today, over 2,000 years later. Paul doesn't pretend it's easy. He's not kidding. It isn't easy. We struggle these days with so many mixed messages, holding on to faith, living with the gospel at the center of life is, is tough. When consumerism's siren song is so loud and clear and blaring in our, eye, our ears. It's not easy to be a Christian with so many competing, tantalizing messages. 
If anyone thinks so, they better trade their gospel in for some lighter reading. It's easier to do something else, not requiring this lifelong commitment that comes with our baptism waters. Today, one of the toughest challenges is getting a grip on faith. Holding on to homes, holding on to cars, holding on to boats and political agendas or jobs is easy compared to getting a grip on faith with integrity. Sometimes you may catch yourself thinking, it's more convenient to sell out the ethical and moral guidelines of faith and buy into and invest yourself in the shimmer and the sheen of a golden calf like the Israelites did when Moses disappeared for a while. And that's when you lose your grip. When holding on to what's important becomes like a greased watermelon floating in the chilly waters of Lake Michigan. Aaron and the Israelites lost their grip when Moses went up Mount Sinai to confer with God about the Ten Commandments. And Moses, when Moses was gone for more than a long weekend, people started to get antsy and grumble about his absence. Can you imagine what the Israelites might have been saying to his brother Aaron? Hey, Aaron! Where's Moses? After leading us around in the desert for these weeks and months, do you think he ditched us here? You think he took a shuttle to a lot and maybe he's lounging on the beach on the Red Sea in a cabana while we suffer out here in the desert and in the hot sun? Making bricks without straw? Well, that was a lot more fun than what we're doing today. Hey, Aaron, give us something tangible to worship, something we can see, something we can hold, something we can, well, we can box up and put away and carry with us. Something we can believe in and control that kind of means, gives us what we want. And that doesn't take so much effort. Now remember, Aaron was Moses' brother. He had been Moses' go-to guy, even his mouthpiece, when stuttering Moses needed eloquence to go before the throne of Pharaoh. And he was Moses' closest friend and confidant when everyone seemed to be against him. But when the natives got restless in Moses' absence, in no time, Aaron had them dancing around a golden calf like a bunch of aborigines. Aaron lost his grip. The Israelites lost their grip. He reminds me of that, well... I think most of us are old enough to say we remember it. The original cast of the Saturday Night Live with Bill Murray and Gilda Radner and Jane Curtin and the Lubner family. Poor Mr. Lubner, he was born without a spine, they would say. Poor Mr. Lubner, he was born without a spine. It reminds me of that family. Aaron failed to hold fast to the excellence of faith, the excellence faith calls us to get a grip on. Too bad Paul wasn't around to show Aaron what faith can do when facing tough times. Paul's life is an example of what it is to get a grip on faith with stonings and shipwrecks and harassment and imprisonment and persecution on his resume. He managed to cover the length and the breadth of the Mediterranean, preaching the gospel of grace and integrity. And this letter to the Philippians, in fact, was written while Paul was in prison, convicted for his faith. You've probably heard that question before, but think about it. If you were ever arrested for being a Christian and put on trial, would the prosecutor be able to discover and present enough evidence from your life to convince a jury 
of your peers to convict you for being a follower of Jesus Christ? Could you be convicted for your faith? Like Moses and the Israelites in the desert, the Philippians depended on Paul as their leader. And when Paul wrote this letter, they were being severely tested. Like Moses would have told the Israelites if he had the chance, Paul tells the Philippians to hold on to the gospel, to hold on to their faith, to live life worthy of their citizenship in Christ's kingship, kingdom. And that's what I was talking with the kids about. That when we are baptized with these waters, we are handed a new passport. And now we become dual citizens. We're citizens in this world, but we're also citizens in the kingdom of God. Can we be convicted for that citizenship? That's what Paul wants us to be able to say we can. There's an epic story about Clarence Jordan, best known for the Cotton Patch Gospel, which uh, was very radical when it came out in the 60s. He was a founder of the Koinonia Farmer Farm, which was an interracial, uh, integrated farm, uh, cooperative farm of, of African American and white folks in the South. And Clarence used to go around and he'd lead uh, revival services. And once he went to a church that was in the Deep South and. This was more than 80 years ago at the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement when segregation was the norm in the South. And Clarence got up to preach and he realized that this congregation, this particular congregation he in, was in, wasn't segregated. There were black folks and white folks, they were all together. And after the service, he asked the pastor, who was an old hillbilly preacher, and I don't mean that in a disparaging way, that's how he is described in the book, how did you get your church, how did your church get this way? And the hillbilly preacher said, well, what way? And Clarence Jordan said, well, black and white folks all together, integrated. Is that because of the Supreme Court decision? And the preacher answered, Supreme Court? Why would Christians need the Supreme Court to tell us, tell us that black folks and white folks ought to be together? Well, how did it happen? Jordan asked. The old preacher said, well, there used to be about 20 people in this church. And when the old preacher died, they couldn't get no one to preach. And so after about two months, I told the deacons I'd preach. They couldn't get anybody else, so, so they said yes. And I got up the next Sunday, I opened the Bible, I put my finger down on that verse that says, in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, but all are one in Christ Jesus. That's in Colossians 3, verse 11. And so I preached that. I told them how Jesus makes all kinds of people one. And when I finished, the deacons said they wanted to talk to me in the back room. And when they got there, they told me they didn't want to hear that kind of preaching no more. And Clarence asked, what'd you do? The old preacher said, I fired them deacons. <laughs> if a man's not going to deek, he ought to be fired. Clarence Jordan was amazed. Well, why didn't they fire you, he asked. Well, they didn't hire me, said the preacher. So they couldn't fire me. You know, once I found out what bothered those people, I gave it to them week after week. I put the knife in the same place Sunday after Sunday. And Clarence was stunned. And they put up with it? Not really, said the preacher. I preached that church down to four people. <laughs> Sometimes revival happens not when people come in, but when people go out. If people were going to stand in the way of move, the moving of the Spirit of God, it's better that they be gone. And after that, we decided that we were going to build the church on people who had a grip on following Jesus. And that's when it started to grow into this integrated church. I get the feeling that Petoskey Presbyterian Church is kind of in the 
beginning of a revival. Where the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached. And the people who follow it hold on to that word at the center of their lives. But it's tough stuff. Because it's easier to dance around those golden calves. It's easier to bow to the world of consumerism and the gods of of secularism. But we have a citizenship we are called to live up to. Getting a grip and holding fast to our Christian faith is not easy in a world that provides a supermarket of opportunities to start dancing around idols like a bunch of aborigines. Whether it's in our work or business or professional, personal or political or social or private lives, hardly a day goes by when we are tempted not to compromise. We, you don't need me to stand here and tell you that what those temptations are. But I can tell you that the struggle to hold on to the gospel, even though it might be like trying to hold on to a greased watermelon in the chilly waters of Lake Michigan, is worth it. And I can tell you that from your faith, you can draw enough strength to say no to dancing around any gold calves that you are confronted with along the way in your faith journey. That with your faith, you can get a grip on living every day with faith integrity. Thanks be to God that we're given this grace that comes from Jesus Christ to even try to live with that kind of faith integrity. Because we know that in our effort, we rely upon God's grace to form and reform God's church in this world. Amen. Let's pray. Our our holy God, how grateful we are for your gospel message. And we pray, O Lord, that even as we live our lives, that we might live them with a mark of baptism, boldly visible in our lives. Help us do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's respond now uh, by singing together hymn number 596 in your hymnal, I Surrender All. And today we're just going to skip verse 2. We'll do verses 1, 3, and 4. And if you would like to stand, you can do so.
and let's pray. Oh, holy God, you are awesome in all your ways. Your magnificence is beyond our comprehension as we move through these quiet months of summer. You have blessed us with the gentleness of summer breezes on hot days. You have offered spectacular displays of power in the light show of thunderstorms. You quench the thirst of earth with strong rains. How can we let a day go by without thanking you? We are overwhelmed by your ever-creating power. But there are times, Lord, when we are overwhelmed in other ways. We catch ourselves with blinders on, keeping us from enjoying these creative moments you place before us daily. We get busy creating our own creations with all the minutia and sense of self-importance, and we forget that everything we have in life finds its source in you. We get distracted and forget that you have given us guidelines in how we ought to live life just so we can take it in and glory in awesome power that has nothing to do with us. From this seventh day of creation on, when we set it aside for rest, you have given us that direction to step back and take life in. You have called us to rest and to recreate, to enjoy this theater of life that you have placed us in called Earth. Jesus himself called us to get away to a quiet place, to breathe in, to breathe out, and to enjoy you, you forever. How we need such restoration. And we ask for it this morning, Lord. We ask that you help us to follow through so that the rest of these summer days may not slip by without our taking the time to thank you. And without taking the time to take it in. Move us towards Sabbath rest that worships you. God of grace, we each carry with us many concerns, concerns for those in our congregation who need you right now, and concerns for people close to us in our own personal lives. We know that you are working in their lives with your healing grace. Listen to us as we pray for them in silence. We ask, Lord, that you astonish them with the hope of the cross and the assurance that life is meant to be a blessing, not a curse, and that your desire is for healing hearts, healing relationships, and hopeful living. There is so much to pray for in this limited amount of time, Lord. So listen now as in silence we offer our own prayers and our own concerns. We pray for those areas in this earth that are torn apart by violence. We pray for Ukraine, the victims of an unjust invasion. We pray for the turmoil in Pakistan and Afghanistan, for the rights of women around the world, especially those who are made victims of unjust religion. We pray for Christians in Cairo, even as a church burned. We pray that what we say this morning may be manifested in action, that we can claim without hesitation that we are your children. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, 
through the Holy Spirit to you, the Creator, all three in one, the beginning and the end. And now we pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Freely we have received, freely let us give. Let us dedicate our gifts so others may know the joy of receiving and giving. Orange cards that say you have given electronically and envelopes are found in the pews to use as the offering plate is passed. You may also give online on our website.
And now uh, please stand if you're comfortable and join us in singing number 597, Take My Life and Let It Be Consecrated. We will do the first and second verse, and then, um, and that's it. Just verse one and two today, please. your blessings in our lives and we claim that right now even as this worship becomes our offering to you and we pray that these financial gifts that we bring to you might empower the ministries of your word to proclaim your gospel in a way that allows the world to get a grip on your purpose in this world bless them to that purpose we pray it in Jesus name amen this is number 231. Presbyterian Church, Petoskey, we put our faith in motion in ways that have a positive, lasting impact on ourselves, the community, and the world. We do this by opening our doors to welcome all people, opening our minds to consider new opportunities and new ideas through the Holy Spirit, opening our hearts to fearlessly and generously reach out to those around us no matter how insurmountable the obstacles before us may appear. We trust in God to guide us and give us the patience and perseverance necessary to keep our faith in motion. Friends, go now into the world in peace. Strive to learn the language of the heart and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be yours this day and forevermore.
sick. She's she's yeah, she's she's getting over the grandkids. 